So, so welcome to this Team 2 uh, session discussion uh, in, in the context of this uh, joint event that we are co-organizing. Um, uh, so the Institut de l'Energie Trottier, based here in Montreal, Uranus, uh, based in Montreal, uh, with the ENM helping us on the logistic and with the, the, the support also of the IV Foundation and the uh, Trottier Family Foundation. Uh, so we have set it up, well, we were supposed to organize a face-to-face -face meeting last June. So that was the simple format of the event that we were supposed to do. Obviously, for, for obvious reason, we have decided to change the format. So we have this event that we organize uh, for the Canadian Institute of, uh, for Climate Choices that we have decided to do in a new format. So it's part online with Zoom conferences. Uh, with consultation happening between uh, yesterday and, and uh, Friday next week. And this will lead, up, will lead us to the forum that will happen on uh, October 7 and October 8. Uh, so there was various themes that, were, that, that, were, uh, that came out of a poll that was done by CICC and that we summarized the results and we wanted to develop transversal themes. And one of the themes that were clearly identified in the, in, the, in the survey was the importance of social and equity dimension of, low, uh, of a low carbon transition and of adapting to a warmer uh, world. So there was a, a theme yesterday on governance and tomorrow there's gonna to be a theme, uh, a theme also, discussion theme on, on making it happen or, uh, 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 or uh, you know, translate this into real action. So, uh, so again, welcome to this uh, theme on social and equity dimension on, on the fight against climate change. So I'll do a quick presentation just to set up how to, uh, uh, how to, to make uh, the, the event uh, as successful as possible. So with respect to language, it's possible to intervene in, in both uh, English and, and French, a language of your choice. There is no simultaneous translation though. Uh, and. Uh, but the website is bilingual. You might have seen that so there is a, well, there's the potential to do online contribution on the website, additional to the discussion that we're gonna have today and, and the, next, uh, the next few uh, days. Uh, and you can make those contributions both in English and French. And there's always a breakout session that is uh, supposed to be bilingual. So you might have been put in the second group uh, following this event. And this means that uh, you can uh, uh, communicate uh, in English or, or French as you want. So some of the ground rules for, for, uh, for the, the consultation process and, and the discussion that we're about to have in the next two hours, we're using the Chatham House rules, meaning that you, know, you can say uh, uh, everything that you want and it will not be targeted as individual uh, citations. It, it's more the group that is talking, talking together and that's what we'll uh, note. The schedule will be enforced, so we have a first one hour period and then afterward we're going to have a one hour uh, discussion period in subgroups. We'll give you instruction a bit later on this. Uh, of course, uh, we're getting more and more accustomed to this now. There's a, an etiquette or a way to do those Zoom meetings, so uh, please if you want to communicate, raise your hand. Uh, try to mute your mic as much as possible uh, in order to, to, to make uh, the event uh, not too noisy. And please be very brief in your intervention. Uh, I'd like to remind also, as I was saying a bit before briefly, there is an online discussions and online contribution tool. So section three of all of the team discussion allows you to write text and to point to references if you want to add information that could that will be useful and that will be considered and integrated in, in the uh, in the reports uh, that that will follow uh, there's also uh, and that's also also a bit of challenge if we would have done the the uh, event in montreal we would have acknowledged uh, the uh, first nation territory that we uh, are sitting on now that everyone is distributed distributed all over the map i invite you to use uh, this tool, the nativeland.ca uh, website, which is really a great tool. Uh, and I invite you to use it before doing an intervention. I invite you to recognize on which land you are sitting on. And there's actually a map, map and you can click here. So I'm from Montreal in the uh, unsick uh, neighborhood. So I'm, I recognize that I'm uh, sitting on the land of the St. Lawrence Iro Iroquoians. 
the Odenosho-Nega uh, 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 also territory and the Mohawk uh, territory. Uh, and by the way, I'm in the neighborhood of Hansik, which is actually the name of, a, an, of an Indian that actually drowned in a river uh, about 200 meters from my house. And it, it gave the name of the, uh, uh, of the neighborhood. And that happened basically about 250 years ago. So there's lots of, well, anyway, there's lots of interesting uh, information on this uh, website that I recommend you uh, to use and to use if you want to uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, the territory you're on uh, before doing an intervention. So, so the agenda, very quickly, uh, will give um, a bit of time to Dale, uh, uh, Vice President and uh, the Research and Analysis Group at the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices to uh, give a, a, a bit of introductory remarks. Then I'll give uh, the mic to Caroline Larrivé, also from Uranos, to do a bit of the team presentation and also to manage the discussions that's going to happen during the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, Ian Morrow from University of Winnipeg is going to provide his initial thoughts on the framing document that you received. And of course, we'll probably invite uh, Ian to be as provocative as possible because the objective here is really to trigger the discussion uh, on the theme of, uh, of the team, on the theme of the day. Uh, at one o'clock, there's going to be a breakout in two subgroups. Um, uh, there, there was initially three subgroups, but we want the number of people to be as optimized as possible to, to, to have not too small of a group, but not too large either. So we have came down, we have come down to two groups and we'll provide a bit more detail on the confirmation of the dates at uh, that time. Uh, I think I've made uh, most of the uh, opening statement with respect to the logistics. Uh, so uh, maybe if people have some uh, questions, maybe it's time to ask them very quickly, uh, but there's gonna be more information that are gonna be provided as we go along the discussion. Alain, so, could you maybe just briefly uh, mention how today's thing feeds into the next steps in, in, uh, right. in our so, process? So there we go. That's the, the slide to explain this. So, so at one o'clock, there's going to be subgroups. So you have the names here that are illustrated with respect to the subgroups. There's also the dates that are confirmed dates uh, to participate in those subgroups. If there's any issues and you're not available for, at those dates anymore, uh, please send us an email and we'll find a way to maybe uh, 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 put you in another group. So the idea here is to discuss about the teams and especially identify research questions that the CICC or any other partners could actually pick up and do research on in the upcoming months, in the upcoming uh, years. That's really the objective of the conference is to try uh, in the name of CICC to, uh, to identify uh, research, forward-thinking research question that are of priority issues in order to advance the fight in, in uh, climate change. And so those discussions that are going to start in one hour and that are going to continue on those dates, okay, are going to be gathered uh, uh, within a, a final session that's going to happen on September 24. So a 20, uh, a two-hour session that's going to be more a synthesis discussion of what the two groups have said, but also a synthesis discussion of the online contribution that has been made or that are going to be made over the, the upcoming 10 or, or two weeks. And then all of this information is going to be synthesized and it's going to be shipped to the forum. So on the first day, we plan to have each of the team uh, contribution to be synthesized and to be discussed on October 7th during the forum. So I think in a nutshell, that's basically the process and how the information is gonna evolve in time. So uh, Dale, is that uh, a good synthesis of how things should happen in your mind? That's perfect, merci Alain. Thanks. So coming back maybe to the agenda, so what I'll do now is I'll stop sharing my screen, my screen in order for people to see each other as much as possible and invite Dale to do the opening uh, remarks. 
Merci, Alain, et bonjour tout le monde. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. I know lots of you, but maybe not quite all of you. Uh, but uh, again, thanks to Alain and Louis and Normand for organizing this thing, especially under very difficult circumstances and having to adapt very capably to a virtual frame rather than a, an in-person one. Um, so uh, just to reiterate a little bit what Alain just said, I think we're here to talk about priorities and I think, let me assure you that, that here at Climate Choices, our governance structures, whether it's the board or the advisory council or the expert panels, are listening very carefully to hear what comes out of these conversations. And we want to make sure we are, are using this as an opportunity to help guide our future work and help take us in directions that are useful and interesting and practical and really helpful uh, as we advance our, our research agenda and our, and, our, and our policy work moving forward. So that takes us to today a little bit where, where we as an organization, where we are a, an independent organization driven by research, looking to provide solid advice and rigorous analysis, more and more as we do our work across all three of our pillars, across adaptation, mitigation, and clean growth, we're increasingly again and again seeing this frame of distributional implications, of social implications, of equity implications, both of a changing climate itself and of the policy options we might consider to, to tackle that challenge, having huge implications uh, on these, these equity and social frames. And we want to more and more take those implications, not as an afterthought or an add-on to our work, but put them right at the center. And I think that the report we're releasing late, later this week, uh, which explores how to measure what we call clean growth, which, which includes progress on climate change, progress on economic factors, but equally important, progress on the social and equity and distributional factors as absolutely representative of, of the frame that we are trying to bring to the climate change policy and research conversation here in Canada. Uh, so I am I'm very keen to hear what we have to say today. I'm very keen, keen to hear the insights and the suggestions uh, and, and the ideas you're gonna throw at us today. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you for joining us and thank you for agreeing that this is an issue and a theme that's worth attention and worth prioritizing. You're on mute, Alain. Yeah, so now I, I will uh, I will invite uh, Carolyn as the president of this session to uh, come on in and uh, and, and do the, uh, the animation. All right, thank you, thank you both. Uh, so it is uh, almost 20 after 12. We have until one o'clock to have this group discussion together. What I'm going to do, uh, so my name is Caroline Larivé. For those that don't know me, I'm the scientific program director here at UHANAS. Um, and I would also like to recognize the uh, territory that, that I'm on. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the same general region as Alain, so I'm generally on the unceded territory also of the St. Lawrence Iroquois and the Mohawk. Um, I, what I'll be doing is I'll just be coming back a bit on the framing document, just um, bringing back kind of the, the high level um, elements. Uh, Dale, you, you already mentioned a lot of them, so I won't be coming back too much on that, but I will then invite Ian Morrow to come and comment um, on this uh, as to, uh, to help initiate the discussions before opening up to everyone. And then you'll be invited also to, uh, in parallel, uh, fill in the, the uh, chat box uh, with questions and comments already to get the, the uh, discussions going. Um, just a reminder that we are trying to find kind of the key, the two, three key questions or issues to feed the discussions uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the breakout groups. So um, just as a reminder, and, and maybe before I get into it, um, I will have Ian Morrow maybe just uh, present yourself uh, quickly before I summarize uh, the framing document elements. Hello, uh, I'm Ian Morrow. I'm the executive director of the Prairie Climate Center at the University of Winnipeg, coming from uh, First Nations, Métis territory. Uh, we're in Treaty One in the homeland of Métis Nation. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. So, just before uh, to kind of get you uh, started on your on your presentation, you all received uh, the document and the framing document. So, I won't go back into too much detail. Just a reminder that, as uh, as mentioned, 
sorry. Ian, I'm going to put you on, can I put you on mute just for now because I'm hearing my echo. Just a reminder that, uh, as Dale mentioned, climate change and, and the low carbon transitions do have unequal impacts or, or distributed uh, uh, unequally uh, in uh, various groups and various regions. Uh, but it's the kind of uh, combined result of climate change effects and the policies that are put in place to, um, to help uh, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the changing climate that have negative impacts for different regions, sectors, economic sectors, and groups of individuals. Uh, so a, a lot of these will be adversely affected. And um, so both the impacts uh, of climate change, the, the, uh, the, uh, the effects of, uh, on the um, natural environment, for example, the flooding, the coastal zones or whatnot, will affect regions and populations differently. But the policies also uh, may affect uh, different uh, regional economies, groups of individuals, they'll affect opportunities, uh, they'll affect the capacity of people to actually find alternative opportunities. And so uh, what we're trying to discuss in this theme is really uh, looking at how, how we can think about these things a little bit differently. And there's really an opportunity here to think about these policies together. So both the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions adapting to a warming world and clean growth. We need to think about these probably in a more integrated way. And probably that's one option of, uh, of, of um, uh, dealing a bit better with the, the, uh, the effects or the uh, unequal distribution effects uh, of these uh, both policies and effects. Uh, there are some initiatives that have been uh, looking at or targeting uh, 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 these policies to kind of reduce these inequalities and there are examples that are mentioned in the policy document and what we're looking at here is how research can really support the design of effective climate policies that don't generate more vulnerabilities or impede our, our capacity to, um, to, uh, to, to make sure that uh, everybody is, is treated equally and, and everybody has a, a chance to, uh, to evolve in this, uh, in this uh, transition. Um, I'll refer you to the document also in, in uh, terms of getting examples of questions. And um, my role uh, from here on will be to really uh, just help ensure uh, the discussion goes smoothly. I will probably intervene if I see that uh, comments are, are a bit too long. But for the moment, I will invite Ian Morrow to kind of initiate the discussions by framing, uh, by, by you know, reacting to this framing document. Ian. Thank you, Messi. Wow, what an opportunity and a privilege and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, you know, tackle what is amongst one of the hardest questions I've ever been posed. You know, when you take a look at uh, the scoping document, the first comment that came to mind was, oh, give me one second, where to begin? You know, I literally just read it and it almost made my head explode in terms of the complexity. And so I thought, well, why don't we start from the top? And if we start from the top, let's talk about the IPCC and who participates in the UN process. And this paper coming out of Global Environmental Change, looking at the assessment reports from 1990 to 2007, does some really interesting things. And so when you take a look at the data, the top five countries, uh, US, UK, Germany, Canada, and Australia, we're pulling about 6% of authorship. Uh, US tops the charts at 31. The authors say that overall we find 45% of countries, all in the developing world, have never had authors participate in the IPCC process, whereas Europe and North American experts make up 75% of the authors. So that to me was fairly interesting in terms of who's participating at that high level in science. Per capita gross uh, GDP, population, English speaking status and levels of education were all statistically significant drivers of authorship. And they noted that the English speaking world in those non annex one developing countries is 2.5 times greater than those of non English speakers for participation. So there's obviously a linguistic, uh, a, a, you know, variable here in terms of who's participating. And 
at the IPCC, there's been scholarship looking at Indigenous knowledge and experience. And so this is from the fifth assessment report. Colleagues James Ford and company, including Laura Cameron, who's now in my group uh, at the Prairie Climate Centre, investigated how Indigenous knowledge is characterized in the IPCC process. And some of their findings were that in the working group two, so the adaptation work specifically, uh, Indigenous references had increased uh, uh, from the fourth assessment report, but coverage in general is limited in scope and it doesn't critically engage in historical and contextual complexities of Indigenous experiences, which are largely overlooked. And I found that particularly interesting in terms of, you know, the depth at which these issues are dealt with at the IPCC. So thinking about Canada and the top, Let's go to the Arctic um, in one second. I can't see my slides. Anyways, the, um, the documented silencing effects of AR5 uh, in working group to contribute towards divorcing climate change from its socio-political, historical, cultural context and constructing climate change as a problem for society as opposed to a problem of society. And they really say that this is a deep political process uh, that doesn't look at the root causes of vulnerability and that it should. We should have a decolonizing lens to this work. And so again, in the Canadian context, thinking from the top down, let's go to the Arctic. You know, some will say that the Arctic is at a tipping point. Uh, this is a photo from the Igloolik region that I took a number of years ago in that, uh, you know, summer months when the sea ice is not there. And when you think about the Arctic and you think about, you know, you know climate change, what comes to mind? You know, and invariably it's polar bears. People will say that often. But when I'm out there on the sea ice platform, this is what I see. This is Master Carver and Master Hunter, the late Luki Erut, hunting a walrus on the sea ice platform. And Iglulik is really, really well known for its walrus, its tasty walrus, huge importance in food security. And so we don't see people in this landscape often. We often look at the animals. We look at the, the kind of scientific indicators. And this is hauling that walrus out. I'm there with Zacharias Kunuk, who's in the foreground. He's the uh, filmmaker that made Atanaju at the Fast Runner. And him and I made a film called Inuit Knowledge in Climate Change that tried to pull in this kind of deeply personal and linguistic, you know, exercise of talking to elders in their language. It's the world's first Inuktitut language film on climate change. And so the work that I do tries to kind of contend with that and pull in language, pull in people, talk about these things in a different kind of way. And when we think about uh, Iglulik, this is the Climate Atlas of Canada, which is the tool that our team at the Prairie Climate Centre made. Uh, Iglulik up in the Canadian Arctic, and this is uh, the number of minus 30 days uh, from baseline of 76 to 2005 to a kind of high carbon far future. We're going to lose about 70 minus 30 days in the Iglulik region. And when you think about that and you think about the impact on the people and the place, it's just tremendously complicated. And so I want to talk about the North in particular in a Canadian context. We have to be talking about the North, given how important it is to our country uh, in terms of you know, various dimensions. And so I, I, I want to nuance that point. Going to the Western Arctic, to the Yukon, we've been working on a project up there in Mount Logan, uh, which is the highest uh, mountain in Canada. If you take a look here, we've got these glaciers coming down and the glacier used to uh, feed the water down this channel, which is the Ayachu River. And as the glacier receded, it started to change the drainage basin and the water started to go down the Kaskawalsh River. And what ended up happening recently is that that river dried up and that water used to feed Kluwani Lake, which is the biggest lake in the Yukon. And scientists came up there, they started to study this uh, really important paper looking at river piracy and the idea that you know, climate driven glacier retreat changes the way in which drainage bases and rivers work. This paper got international attention, New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine talking about, oh my goodness, you know, the glacier retreats in a geological instant and you know, all of the downstream impacts. Yet when we went to the Arctic and we contacted the Kluwani First Nation years after this paper was published and these, pa these, these articles were written, the community said, no one's come here to talk to us. Literally no one. And so we said, well, we should start a project. Let's work together. Let's articulate your voices. And we're involved in making a large scale feature film with the community about this impact. And it just, it blew my mind that this is still going on, that we are not including people, that science drives the agenda and that we need to have what many people are articulating as a people first approach. This is Henry Huntington and a lot of colleagues that I really respect, including community members from the North, talking about region, in a regional environmental change, about reframing climate change in policy and research to make sure health, poverty, education, culture, vitality, equity, justice, 
And all of these people focused topics are just as important as the science because people are being impacted, but we're not talking about it in the same kind of way or with the same kind of uh, equity with respect to the, the, the impacts. And so people are talking about that in the North in a big way. When we look at specific people uh, in that landscape, Indigenous women, this is an article by Kyle White, who's a really important Indigenous scholar, saying that women in these communities, they take on extra responsibilities. They, when change happens, they as kind of leaders in their community have to do certain things and change the way that they interact to safeguard their communities, but that adversely impacts them even further. And so we have to look at the gendered impacts, in this case, Indigenous women in particular, especially in the context of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We need to be thinking about and including these diverse ways of thinking about climate change, as this scholarship notes. Going back up into the Inuit world, this is Pitsilak Pfeiffer, who's a really, really thoughtful Inuit scholar saying, Inuit Namipita, which is Inuit, where are we, is what he's saying. And he asked the question, why in spite of so much research and policy focus on Arctic climate change, are we Inuit still consultants or fillers in an otherwise Western driven enterprise to monitor climate developments in Inuit Nunangat, which is Inuit territories? And, you know, I've been going to the Arctic for two decades and it's still happening. I haven't seen the transformational change that you'd think the investment in Arctic research would lead to, to integrated research with communities. There's pockets of it. There's really good researchers and really good relationships, but structurally we haven't met the needs of communities on their terms at all. ITK, the Inuit Tepidi Katanami is, you know, got a climate change strategy which articulates what their needs are in a very, very high resolution format, talking about knowledge and capacity, well-being and environment, food systems, infrastructure, energy. They've got the details laid out here in terms of what they want to see happen because it's a matter of life and death, literally, for the Arctic. If you look at the social and economic inequity in Inuit Nunangat on the left versus all of Canada, just let that sit in for a second. I think we need to be uncomfortable. We need to unsettle ourselves. We need to seriously question why this is happening in Canada. My wife is a, a indigenous um, midwife. And you look at the bottom, the infant mortality rate is three times higher in Inuit territories than the rest of Canada. How is that possible? And then layer climate change on top of that. And this is a system that is on the brink. And so the equity issues around the north, again, very important. I want to go south, so from top to bottom, and bring us down into the Canadian prairies. I'm using Estevan as an example. Uh, the length of the frost-free season. So in the historical baseline, 131 days, up by about a full month in that high carbon far future, which is our CP 8.5 in these models. Um, so we're going to see potential opportunities in these spaces as well. And how do we start to kind of think about that? Well, our team has a farmer focused approach. We've been interacting with a lot of farmers. We've been asking them questions. We've been trying to understand, you know, how they're mitigating with energy and emissions, how they're sequestering, you know, through livestock management, how they're adapting. And we are also, again, taking that gendered approach and looking at gender research. And in particular, here's uh, Amber Fletcher from the University of Regina speaking about uh, gender and agriculture and the critical role that women play in buffering risk in farm systems. When the men are often on the front lines of dealing with animal and cattle, the women are looking after the house and tending a lot of these things and not exclusively, but in a large way, kind of protecting the family from those climate change risks. And it's a, a really important piece of work is putting out here. And again, without gender analysis, we emit key aspects of social life in a changing climate. It's absolutely critical that we build these in, not as an aftersight or a side project, but throughout a research agenda moving forward. So with respect to farmers, a paper by Bernard Subri, who's actually a former student of mine, asking the question, are we taking farmers seriously? And in a review of the literature from 2007 to 2018, they conclude that with some exceptions, the field does not substantively embrace farmers' perceptions as a contribution to adaptation discourse, whereas the farmers are mostly characterized as passive and vulnerable rather than viably adapting. And we see this time and time again, that people who are not experts, are seen as vulnerable and they're kind of in trouble and the capacity of these communities is often not prioritized in research compared to how much impacted or vulnerable kind of they are. And so we need to find a balance between kind of vulnerability and capacity in our approach, approach moving forward in a, in a really important way. 
Other papers about farmers on the left, this is from Australia, looking at about well-being in a changing climate. You know, farmers in, you know, Western Australia, which is fairly similar to, you know, the Canadian prairies, are under huge distress, culminating in heightened perceived risks of depression and suicide. So we have, you know, a huge issue with respect to the potential impact on, you know, food producers. On the right, you know, this is a, an investigation looking at climate skepticism in Scotland. You know, farmers in a large way are often characterized as skeptics, as people that don't get it, as people that don't understand. And this is investigating climate skepticism. And it's very interesting. They tease apart through quantitative multivariate statistics that skepticism is not a uniform thing. It's incredibly nuanced. And so people will be skeptical of certain parts of climate change, but not others. And so when we approach skeptical audiences, we have to do it with a research understanding that understands how the cognitive psychology of the mind works and what is going to drive you know people to act versus drive them away and so this is an interesting paper from journal of environmental psychology we see this in our work all the time ian cushion on the left an amazing farmer from the estevan region uh interviewing him on the right his father who's over a hundred years i've never i've interviewed hundreds of people never interviewed a centigenarian before so this guy was 102 years old he had been voluntarily submitting his uh, his uh, weather observations to Environment Canada. That's his graph from 50 to 89 of his personal climate observation, essentially. So again, the work that some of these people are doing is mind blowing. On the left, his son, Ian, a, a, a long-standing organic farmer at the total vanguard of sustainable agriculture in Canada. I'm interviewing him. We're talking about climate change. He's totally in tune. He understands it. Midway through this interview, I realized that the pump jack faded in the background of that image is actually his. And so this mind-blowingly kind of talented organic farmer is pumping oil. And I'm sitting there trying to reconcile this going, what, what is happening? And so we start talking about it. And he said, this is short term. I'm pumping this oil to drive the viability of, you know, thousands of years of food production on the land that I am standing on. And so he squared the complexity. And again, the value of farmers to kind of take us through that is often underlooked. So we leave Ian Cushion's house and go to the Boundary Dam, the CCCS, the first carbon capture storage facility in the world. Howard Matthews, the VP of Power Production, takes us on a tour of the CCCS facility. And I went in with preconceived notions. I thought clean coal, you know, is this really part of the solution? Is this really what we're gonna be kind of, am I gonna, you know, bite hook, line and sinker on this? And, you know, we can debate the merits of the technology, but the culture inside this building was unbelievable. Third and fourth generation coal miners saying that I am part of the climate change solution saying that I am here in a different way than my ancestors and I am going to help contribute to a sustainable world. Yet this facility has been highly demonized and the people who work in it have been demonized for being the, the, the kind of tantamount to kind of, you know, climate change, you know, problem. And so, you know, how do we deal with our own baggage around how we think about these different communities is a really important question, especially as you know, coal starts to transition out. So this government document, uh, the Just and Fair Transition, we've got pockets of communities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, where we're going to see a big change uh, with respect to the phasing out of coal. And the report talks about thousands of people losing their jobs by 2030. And there's a really sophisticated plan here to address this, which I'm, I think is fabulous from the government of Canada. But this idea that people will be out of work because of climate change, I think is one of the biggest things that we are going to have to contend with. And this paper uh, coming out of the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences in 2018, the impact of unemployment and economic risk perceptions on attitudes towards anthropogenic climate change, really important piece. Um, and it's investigating Republicans and Democrats in the United States. And the final part there, I find that exposure to economic risk increases the likelihood of climate change denial among both Democrats and Republicans. And so if we take a look at the data, you got Republicans on the left, Democrats on the right. And as the unemployment rate in the jurisdictions where this survey was conducted over time, a longitudinal Pew study um, or data that they, draw, they, they analyzed the data from, as unemployment rates increased in those areas, the levels of denial correspondingly increased. And so I think that as we face, you know, the phasing out of certain industries, the potential for climate denial could, 
according to this paper, increase. When we think about the pandemic and the idea that people are out of work right now, if the underlying cognitive structures are that climate change is not important or doesn't exist or isn't real because there are other priorities in terms of employment driving the way people think, these are things we really need to consider moving forward, especially in the context of COVID-19. And when we look at uh, Eric LeChapelle's work from the University of Montreal, uh, looking at the estimated percent of adults who think the earth is getting warmer postly or most, partly or mostly because of human activity, we see that you know, this climate denial is in some ways very geographically distributed in the Canadian Prairie provinces predominantly. This map actually looks a lot like, ding, the last federal election. So the political implications of denial are incredible in terms of how we're going to navigate this nationally. And so, you know, we got denial in the prairies, but looking back at the climate atlas, the number of plus 30 days from the historical baseline to this kind of high carbon far future, the prairies are going to warm up amongst the hottest and fastest of any parts of Canada. So we've got huge denial, yet also a highly impacted area. So how do we square the kind of psychology with the climate science? This holistic integrated way of thinking and addressing the issues is something we need to grapple with. And we really need to grapple with this fast. When unemployment alienation lead to denial, especially with Western alienation, you know, which was before the pandemic, the biggest thing. Christina Freeland got, you know, allocated to dealing with Western alienation as the main priority for the federal government. And then the pandemic hit. This is still brewing underneath the surface in a huge way. And uh, this particular author, Katz Rosen, says Western alienation is also a concern because it has given rise to xeno phobic populism in other jurisdictions of the country. And I think when we think about, you know, post-truth, when we think about data, when we think about science being thrown down the toilet and not give, being given the kind of credibility that it deserves because of these trends in society, well, part of the climate research agenda needs to be aware and tracking this and figuring out how to deal with these issues. Because again, the federal election in the US is coming up as this kind of unfolds. We are in uncharted territory around how we deal with the project of science alone, including climate science. This is kind of, you know, reared its head in Ontario. So economic populism and the authors here really say that we need to get a handle on this because, you know, arguably uh, cap and trade in Ontario got really hamstrung because the idea that it was an attack on working families. The idea that the pricing was an attack on people, you know, wasn't, we, there was no way to communicate this. And so that idea of populism, again, is hampering our ability with climate policy in all kinds of ways. And so this is an important thing to consider. When we think about COVID and climate change, a paper that just came out, this is 2020. Uh, Daniel Rosenblum, who I've met and many of you might, uh, has looked at the tale of two crises, COVID-19 and climate. You know, it's pretty neat what they're talking about here with respect to, you know, this idea that we can disrupt the system and reduce, you know, carbon futures while kind of creating innovation in this kind of critical moment where we've got these two crises unfolding at once. But I would argue, that's very theoretical and not to dismiss the paper. It's very theoretical. Look at all the underlying things that we've just discussed here. You know, the things that drive how society will respond to transitions and approach, you know, change are so layered in terms of people's diverse experiences across the landscape that if we're not addressing those diverse experiences, we will never be able to create a, a, a beautiful graph like this that we desperately need. So, I started from the top, but what I'm actually arguing is that we need to start from the bottom. We need a co-designed research agenda that includes people at every phase. Because if people aren't included, then they're going to feel like they're excluded. And I think we've done a lot of exclusion in general in science, but in particular in climate change science. It's, it's very hard to kind of pull people into kind of synthetic research agendas with grants and, you know, all the different things that thing, you know, how it works out, you know, the metrics for peer review, it's very kind of cumbersome and it takes time to work with communities, but we desperately need a bottom up approach. This is a really neat paper from Wires Climate Change, looking at the co-production and climate change research. And if you take a look at this prism that they talk about, you know, they move through, you know, how we include nature and ourselves, that people first approach, institutional change, economic systems. Systems, you know, institutional governance, you know, public service, including traditional knowledge, you know, co-learning and facilitating of social learning on climate issues. We need a very diverse, you know, prism, as this paper articulates, 
to build a bottom-up research agenda, and I would argue that we really desperately need that. So I'm, I'm talking about underrepresented groups, I'm talking about the North, I'm talking about collaboration with communities as major features of this conversation. And I want to take you back to the North as a final few thoughts. I'm walking through Iglulik one day, and I see this kid riding his, his tricycle like a skateboard into this piece of wood, and bang, he's flying through the air like Superman. And this kid is doing it on repeat. And if you've ever spent any time in a Northern community, there's often not a lot of services for young kids. And these kids are figuring out how to do a lot with a little, how to be creative under pressure, and how to solve challenges in their own lives, like just passing the time. And I don't think we give kids enough credit in the system. I don't think we take their you know, issues seriously. Obviously, Greta Thunberg and all these folks have put that on the map. But by and large, young people are not having a voice in this conversation and they desperately need one because I think the agenda would change very, very quickly if they had a voice the way that us as climate scientists or experts have a voice. And that young voice is also complemented by the elders. And so this is my final slide. This is Elisipi Ishilutak, a revered Inuit artist from the community of Pangnertung. She's since passed away. She has the most beautiful face I've ever seen with my own eyes. And Elisa P would invite you in and make you just part of her family immediately. But she was a prolific artist and she is very, very well known around the world. And before she died, this, this picture was made and it's called Climate Change. And this image that she drew with colored pastels kind of shows that soft igloo kind of bending over. And this Inuk looking up in its traditional clothes, looking at a tree. But this isn't a scary picture. This isn't a picture of the world going to hell in a handbasket. This is a picture of people adapting to change. This is how she saw it. This is her image of climate change. And you know, it, it's a beautiful image of, of people figuring it out. But you know, who's asked Elisabeth Ishlutak about her views and how you know, a person who lived in a pre-colonial world, she see, saw white people for the first time in like her mid thirties. You know, what is their experience? How do we pull that in? How do we make a conversation that includes all these people is something that I think we want to talk about. And it's a great privilege to be able to kind of have this initial conversation with you. So thank you, Messi, Quayan, and Mick. Thank you, Ian, uh, for a lot of food for thought. I noticed that people were not really filling in the, um, the chat box. So I, I will encourage you to do that. But I did see people taking notes. And from what I know of the people of the people that are here that I do know, I know that people have a lot to say. What I'm finding really interesting and what came out uh, is, is not just about the research questions, but it's very much also about how the research is actually done. I think that's a really, um, a really important point that you bring into this conversation. Um, I'd have other things, but I, I think I'm going to open it up right now. I, I think there might be people uh, that have things to say. We have about uh, a little about 10 minutes before we go into breakout groups and I'd like to make just give you a bit of time and space for some general comments uh, questions maybe for Ian or just uh, questions to get the discussion going before you go into breakout groups um, in terms of uh, etiquette maybe if you are to speak please put your camera on and if you want to speak uh, maybe raise your hand if um, I'll give you a few minutes and Alexander perhaps you can help me if ever you see. So I don't know, I see um, Dale and Catherine uh, have, and, and, and uh, Kathy have, have uh, reacted. Maybe you want to, uh, to say a few words. Any questions? I think Louis, Louis. has his uh, hand raised also. Okay, Louis. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ian. It's a very interesting and moving presentation. Uh, you said something about the cognitive aspect of it, and, and uh, um, yeah, cog cognition is really important here. And but aren't we facing like an uphill battle against all those marketeers and people that are way better than 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 us at at framing that message and and making sure that people will keep doing what they're they've been doing so far? Thank you. 
Well, I, I, my group is really interested in climate communication. Like that's what we do in, in our bread and butter. And the reason why, you know, I, I, I trained as an environmental scientist, I moved into social sciences and I got heavy into communication because when you look at the technical challenges we have in front of us, we have the solutions. You know, by and large, we know what we need to do. What we don't have is the social buy-in to scale those solutions. And so for me, you know, it's not to denigrate the technical science. We obviously need it. But the idea that social science and, you know, the kind of social spaces play in some ways a backseat to it is kind of like having a cart in front of the horse because we can't pull those technical solutions unless we've got society with us. So arguably, uh, the war will be won and, and lost around psychology and communication. And if we are, you know, going, well, those other groups have more money and more power and they'll be able to out lobby us then we might as well just pack up these meetings and not do anything because it's a battle for information. You know, it's a battle for our minds. And that is in some ways, I think the, 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 the kind of core feature of every piece of work that gets done in Canada and around the world needs to be glommed onto a very sophisticated communication strategy that makes it count. Because if we can't make it count, then why should we be doing it? You also mentioned Ian something about uh, um, the need for, um, uh, you know, be, being thoughtful and, 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 and recognizing our own preconceived ideas. And I think that might be part of it in terms of it's not just communication, but it's really about how, what kind of compassion we can show through these. I saw uh, Rebecca and Jimena that were unmuted. So I think, Rebecca, did you want to add something? Sure, I have a quick question. First, I'll introduce myself. Rebecca World, I, I work for Canadian Institute for Climate Choices as the engagement director. Uh, and just want to recognize I'm on uh, Tonquichon land here. Ian, thank you for that incredible presentation. I am patching in from, from the north. I'm from the Yukon, um, and especially the, uh, the, the comments of the, the Kiwani region were um, incredibly powerful. I've driven through that area uh, both before and after the river piracy, uh, and it's shocking, and I, I've had some good conversations with folks locally, and it's, it's extraordinary. My question to you, and I do know that others have some experience in this world as well, uh, as we talk about um, opening up spaces, as we talk about an integrative approach, uh, social, social uh, and equity aspects to our work, I know some of the questions that I get in my work, and I wonder if you get these questions too, and how do you deal with these questions, is how do you, how do you reconcile, on one hand, needing, needing often to move at the speed of trust when we're working with, um, working with diverse populations uh, that you were speaking of, uh, moving at the speed of, the tr of trust and reconciling that with uh, a more sort of Western approach of deadlines and contribution agreements. And I know you're in the academic world, so you're probably no stranger to this. I'd love to hear your perspectives on this. And I also suspect Marjorie and many others have, have, have this experience as well. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I think I work in the commodities of trust and empathy. And I think that trust is the biggest commodity in a sense, because if you don't have trust, you can't move forward together. And trust is something that is obviously earned in these communities, especially indigenous communities. You can't just walk in there and assume that you have the right skills or the right relationships. And, you know, people like Heather Castleton has talked about, you know, drinking tea for a year before you start a research project. And so the timelines can change. Um, but I've also seen the opposite. I've seen projects happen so fast because communities know what they want. And when they find a partner that can help make it happen, they're ready to rock and roll. And the project in Kluwani First Nation is very much like that. We contacted them, you know, in almost a parachute in, parachute out kind of way. We were like, you know, are you interested? We don't usually kind of fish for partners like that. And as we got into the conversation and they said, you know, no one has come and talked to us about this. We're not being honored. The change to the lake 13 feet drop in the biggest lake in the Yukon, their access, their road, you know, winter roads, they're hunting, they're fishing, everything has changed. And they're not even being asked questions. They're not even being talked to. You know, it's unbelievable that that's still happening. And so they were like, yes, we're interested. And, you know, in terms of, I think research is about uh, respect and reciprocity. And so we have in our process, uh, we, we deal in the currency of respect, you know, and so we say, yes, we're here to listen. We brought money to the table. We said, we've got resources. 
And the reciprocity about giving back and making sure that that's clear, that that is the objective of the research. It's not to write a paper or get your kind of goal as an academic. It's about to give back. And so we communicate these things and we talk about these things. And, you know, these communities are highly intelligent, as you know. Uh, and when they hear the right things and they understand the intent of the heart, uh, they are ready to play. And so that project with KFN happened really, really fast. I've had other projects happen like that. And, and I think it's also about the modality of research. And so we work in a medium where people's voices are actually baked into the visuals and the video. And we're not there to take their knowledge and publish papers with our names on it. We're there to let their knowledge flow through them to a broader audience. And so the idea that how you do the research matters. And so um, I think that institutionally, that can be a challenge, you know, and so I work in a, in a way to kind of build resources that allow me to do the work in the community level while still meeting the requirements of funders. And so we, we work kind of, you know, the accounting of projects, you know, uh, is an important thing so that you, you have the buffer to make sure you've got the time uh, or the resources to do the right things. And so funding needs to change. You know, you look at the Tri-Council or any of the kind of fund opportunities, it's really problematic. Like the research funding needs to change the way that communities interact. And so that gets back to that co-design piece. If we're advocating at the highest levels with the top experts saying, we need co-design, we need money for time, we need money for communities to be at the table you know look who's on the call right now we don't we don't have community members here and maybe that's not the point of this call but we need to find ways to pull them in thank you ian for that response and it bring maybe it, it also helps to feed uh the the discussions around uh not just the research questions but how the research is done and maybe uh that is also a role for cicc to look at uh the funding of the research how the research is done and the metrics that we can use to ensure that that is what is va um, valued. Uh, I think Jimena, you had a, you had unmuted yourself. Did you want to talk? Hi everyone. Um, I'm just going to start up my video here. I've been having problems with the internet, and I just wanted to also recognize that the land from which I am calling you, and where I live and work, is a traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Um, thank you, Ian, for the really uh, engaging and awesome presentation um, with some disturbing bits to it, for sure. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments, and we can pick up on these uh, threads uh, later on in our breakout discussions. But one, one comment that, um, one thing that you mentioned, Ian, that I appreciate is the, the need to make sure that communication, psychology, better social science, sociology, anthropology, those capacities are brought into uh, interdisciplinary research teams. Because I often find that in, in my own work, and I work for an environmental science consulting firm, um, that my colleagues who are you know, more ecologists or come from a natural science background, they understand the importance of science communications and the need for engagement and things like that, but they're not trained and don't have those skills. And I find that they're constantly trying to kind of learn on the job. Um, but I, I do think it's our responsibility to make sure that the, the adequate and trained skill sets are part of the team and to budget for that. So that's just one comment. The other comment I just wanted to make quickly is, um, and you started off by talking about the inclusion of developing country participants in uh, IP the IPCC process, but I don't want to lose sight also of Canada's role in supporting um, developing country mitigation and adaptation, given our historical responsibility and burden of industrial emissions um, dating back to industrialization. So um, I didn't want to lose sight of that aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you, Great Jimena. points, and um, obviously in, in a very short period of time, it's hard to kind of get at all the pieces, so I tried to kind of do a scan. Um, I think that one of the, the points about, you know, the research teams, you know, Dan Sugar, the guy that wrote the, the River Piracy paper, you know, he went and did this amazing, like, nature geoscience paper, you know, that made global headlines, and he brought a huge amount of attention. Is it his personal responsibility to also have a team to consult and work with the community? Probably not. The guy's a glaciologist, right? But, you know, how do you protect, you know, communities and work with communities to ensure that when an event like that is happening, there's the ample resources and teams kind of built upon that initial research to ensure that we're, we're not excluding people in that kind of way. And so it's an interesting challenge, right? And I agree with you. It's not the role of scientists to do social science work. That actually leads to a lot of problems. 
And so we have to figure out how to kind of create those transdisciplinary teams um, in moments of crisis to make sure that we're not missing pieces and we're moving forward in a good way. Yeah, maybe we need to create them before we hit the crisis because it's not during the crisis that you can develop these relationships. Um, I see that it's now one o'clock. There's uh, basically one hour left for the breakout sessions. I am going to uh, turn back to the um, organizers to kind of help me in the next steps here. But what I'd just like to uh, mention, uh, first of all, thank you, Marjorie, for the comment uh, in the chat box. That is, uh, I think those are the kinds of ideas and initiatives that we want to be looking at. What works well? How did they how did they, um, uh, you know, what were the components and, and what can we learn from these? So uh, uh, the, um, uh, the example you refer to is the food guide developed uh, that considers social equity and livelihood and whatnot. So thank you. And, and those, I think we're looking for those kinds of examples as well.